No, so um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, being here. For some of you, this is really early in the morning. I'm actually now back home in the Netherlands. So for me, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I really would have loved to come to PNNL, but unfortunately in these times, it's very difficult. But I'm still grateful that uh, this conference uh, was still organized and that we have this workshop now and that we can talk about uh, uh, native mass spectrometry. I'm really delighted to see that there's uh, quite some time uh, spent on, on this topic uh, with excellent uh, talks uh, following after my talk as well. So I think uh, this can be a very exciting session. So basically, um, I picked a few things that I want to talk about and uh, I want to ask a real basic question. Um, what is actually a protein? And uh, especially in, in the context of biomarkers, uh, plasma proteins, I really want to address that question and I actually don't have a real answer, but I want you all to think about that question. Um, what is really a protein? <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about is how we work with native mass spectrometry, um, developing instrumentation to address new questions uh, that can be solved. And this is primarily on plasma proteomics, but I will also talk about how we use these uh, methods to uh, study virus particles, um, how we increase sensitivity and can now really do single particle detection. And in the end, <clears throat> because it's also a structural biology oriented meeting, um, I hope to have some time to talk also about uh, our cross-linking efforts. So basically where I start with is that native mass spectrometry has been around for, for more than 20 years. Uh, but recently, uh, since about 2012, um, we worked together with Thermo Fisher to make it also amendable uh, on Orbitrap mass spectrometers. And as you may know or may not know, native mass spectrometry looks at large proteins or large protein complexes. And mass spectrometers are normally not made for that. Mass spectrometers are normally made for small molecules, uh, maybe for peptides. And the transmission of these small ions through these instruments is, is optimized and is uh, sort of perfect. But if you talk about large proteins and protein complexes, the instrument is not perfect for it. And that starts already with the ionization but it also starts uh, or, or it follows with the transmission of these ions through the instrument. These high mass ions are way slower than peptides because they have a bigger mass. And therefore transmission of these ions in a standard instrument is very low. So we worked together with uh, Thermo Fisher on this and uh, we really uh, developed uh, a new generation Orbitrap mass spectrometers. Uh, one of them, the first one was called the EMR, the Orbitrap with extended mass range. And in 2017, uh, we developed, uh, co-developed this UHMR, uh, which stands for Ultra High Mass Range uh, Orbitrap Mass Spectrometer. Now, actually, the instrument doesn't look that different from a standard Orbitrap Mass Spectrometer, except that uh, what is done is that there are several modifications in RF fields to get the transmission of these slow ions, the high mass ions, better. And also, uh, a special quadrupole is put in that can really select high mass ions that have high M over Zs uh, to do further experiments on uh, down, uh, um, down further on in the instrument. So for the rest, it's not such a big difference with the standard uh, Orbitrap mass spectrometer, but it's really dedicated to, to get better uh, transmission of these ions through it. So we <clears throat> worked on that already in 2012 and, and we, uh, <clears throat> sort of uh, introduced this uh, EMR and we saw already that it really gave us a very high resolving power um, for large proteins and large protein complexes. And this is all text from our 2012 paper. I'm not going to read it up out loud, but we already proposed that this could work very well for looking at intact glycoproteins and that it could also work very well for looking at very large protein complexes. Now, one of the first spectra that we acquired on this Orbitrap EMR was of an intact antibody, and we used native mass spectrometry for this. Now, in native mass spectrometry, the ions are sprayed from a native solution, normally it's aqueous ammonium acetate, and then they retain much less charges than in normal mass spectrometry. And you see that over here because the peaks you see uh, are from the antibody, and the antibody is about 150 kilodalton, and they attain only 25 charges. Now, the peaks that we saw in the Orbitrap were sort of uh, unprecedented, 
we, we almost uh, they almost look like isotope peaks, but that's not the case. What you actually see is the intact antibody, and then the satellite peaks that you see is the different forms of glyco glycosylation that are attached to the antibody. So in a direct measurement, you see the intact mass of the protein, but you also see the glycosylation of the protein. And this is very important for, for companies developing antibodies because this sort of spectra gives them a quality control of the um, uh, intactness of their antibody, but also on the uh, rate of glycosylation that is uh, on the antibody. So this was a, a real breakthrough spectrum that actually also sort of convinced Thermo that this might be an interest, interesting concept to develop further and to commercialize. And now this instrument is indeed used by many academic labs, but also by my, many uh, biopharmaceutical labs. So um, I see this antibody with, with the glycosylation and uh, I ask you this question, what is now really a protein? Now, it, the, the term has been used already at the meeting as well. Uh, we have proteins and we have proteoforms. And this is a very nice paper by Lloyd Smith, Neil Kelleher, and a lot of other people. We were also involved. And it actually induced, uh, introduced the concept of proteoform. And what is a proteoform? Now, basically, we have in our body about 20,000 genes. But if you look at a particular gene, how many protein products can this make? Now, yeah, classically, you would say only one. But because of all these processes that are summarized on this slide, uh, starting with splicing, uh, proteolysis, by mutations. There can be many new forms of the protein as well. And this number even explodes further if you start to look also at the modifications that can happen after the protein has been synthesized by the ribosome. And these modifications we call post-sensational modifications. And these post-sensational modifications lead to new proteins because they can really make the protein give a different function. If a protein is, uh, for instance, phosphorylated or non-phosphorylated, can sometimes be the difference between an active kinase and a non-active kinase. So this term proteoforms um, was introduced uh, in this paper, um, but basically that means that one gene can maybe lead to many, many, many proteoforms. And this is especially the case when you look at protein glycosylation, because that's extremely heterogeneous. So just to show why we use native mass spectrometry to look at intact proteins and their proteoforms, I just use this slide where you see, it's a sort of schematic, you see an, a native mass spectrum and a denatured mass spectrum from, let's say, a simple bacterial protein, a phosphorylated protein in the middle, and a glycosylated protein at the bottom. And what you clearly see, if you do this by denaturing mass spectrometry, attains much more charges than when you do it by native mass spectrometry. But in this case, both may lead to very sharp peaks and an intact mass that can be easily measured. But if the protein is phosphorylated, you see already that it gets a bit more congested. But still, if your resolution is high enough, you can resolve these peaks and you actually see these 80 Dalton shifts uh, induced by the phosphorylation of the protein. So we directly measure the intact mass and we see then the phosphorylation happening on the protein. Now at the bottom, if you look at protein glycosylation, this can be extremely heterogeneous and can lead to many different masses of the resulting protein. And therefore, if you do this by denaturing mass spectrometry, all these peaks start to overlap widely. And that's why it's beneficial to look at this by native mass spectrometry at least when your resolution is good enough to resolve these peaks. So to show a real example of that, uh, this is an example from a few years ago, we analyzed a simple protein. Uh, maybe you know it, it's EPO, it's a therapeutic protein. It's a very small protein. It has only a mass of, a backbone mass of 18 kilodalton, but it carries three N-glycosylation sites and one O-glycosylation site. And these three m glycosylation sites and these one o glycosylation site, they can be occupied with different glycans. And so the combinatorial combination of all these modifications may lead to different forms, different proteoforms of erythropoietin that all also have a different mass if what is attached to them has a different mass. So here I just show this example, EPO, if we measured it by native mass spectrometry, it doesn't have a mass of 18 kilodalton, which is the backbone uh, sequence, 
but it does have a mass of about 30 kilodalton and is decorated with all these different glycans. And instead of having only one mass, we actually see in this mass spectrum, it depends a bit how long you look at it, we see more than 230 different peaks. So all these molecules of EPO have a different glycosylation um, um, decoration. And in principle, that may mean that they also have all a different activity. So it's important to be able to characterize these proteoforms of the protein, but it also really shows you that if you talk about EPO, yeah, which molecule are you talking about? It's known, for instance, that some of these forms are higher sialiated than others. And it's also known that if you look at EPO, how it can transfer over the blood-brain barrier, that the sialiation on the EPO is extremely important. So some of the forms that you see in this spectrum will go over this barrier easier than others and are therefore functionally different proteins. And that's the point I want to make. So what do we do in the lab now? We sort of uh, use this intact mass profiling to get a proteoform profile. But if you know the intact mass, you actually don't know yet which sites were occupied and which glycans were exactly on these different sites. So we combine this with, let's say, just uh, uh, bottom-up glycoproteomics, and then we hope to cover every glycoside with the peptide data. And if we have quantitative data on the occupation of every site, we can actually use the peptide data to uh, simulate the native mass spectrum that we record. And if these simulations fit what we exactly measured, then we know that we didn't miss any of the glycosylation and we have really mapped all the proteoforms of the protein. Uh, this turns out to be a very powerful approach to, to look at all these um, uh, modifications on, on the protein. So we uh, looked at EPO, which is a therapeutic protein, but then we also thought, okay, let's maybe do now also plasma proteomics, but let's do it very different. Let's not look at how many proteins we can detect, but let's just take one protein at a time. And actually we started to look at the proteins that are normally disregarded in plasma proteomics experiments. We looked at the very, very high abundant proteins in plasma. Normally they are you know, uh, disregarded from the plasma by pull downs with, with columns to get deeper into the proteome. But many of those, and you see some of them here circled in, in red, are actually abundant proteins that are also glycoproteins. And we started to look at these glycoproteins one at a time and really try to purify them from plasma. So we do this in a very simple way. We just use uh, plasma. We actually still deplete albumin, I have to admit. But then we fractionate just by a combination of cation exchange and anion exchange. And our fractionation is not as good as what you get with peptide separation, but we can actually collect different fractions. And for instance, in this fraction, uh, 22 to 23 minutes, we isolate quite neatly uh, the plasma protein fatuin. And so we said, okay, let's first look at this fatuin um, isolated from, from human plasma. Now, is this an interesting protein? Um, yeah, you can argue about that. Normally in proteomics experiments, you don't give it that much attention. But for instance, this is a cell paper just from a month ago where they looked at uh, plasma proteome changes upon bacterial infections. And surprisingly, uh, the top protein biomarker is fatuin. But then I start to ask if I read this paper, which fatuin do they actually mean? They just measure the complete uh, fatuin concentration, but they don't look at the different proteoforms of fatuin. So fatuin, how interesting is it? Uh, here's a sequence of fatuin. Uh, here's the uh, well, here's the backbone sequence. It has uh, two M glycosylation sites. It has three O glycosylation sites depicted there. It even has a phosphorylation site. And even more interestingly, it can also be cleaved, processed. And then a piece is cut out, and you see that by the arginine in the middle. And then a disulfide bond actually keeps the two chains together. So the protein, when it gets processed, it gets modified with glycosylation, with O-glycosylation and glycosylation. It gets modified with phosphorylation. And it also can get processed by proteases in the plasma. 
So this one protein is actually an extremely exciting story if you take all these processes into account. So what does that mean if we start to measure fatuin isolated from human plasma? Now here's the mass spectrum that we get for it. It's actually a single charge state of it. But you see again that for this protein, we detect maybe about 100 different peaks. And by using also the glycopeptide data, we can annotate all these peaks in the mass spectrum. Now this is fatuin isolated from a single donor. And we use typically 50 to 100 microliters of plasma. But if you look at this and, and you look maybe it's early in the morning, you don't look too well, you think, hey, this looks a bit like the barcode I see on the products that I buy in the supermarket. So is this true? Is this a barcode for this single donor? So we said, okay, let's now also look at uh, Fatuin from other people. And what we had is a small cohort um, of 20 people. Um, 10 of them were supposedly healthy, uh, male and female. And 10 of them had actually uh, recovered from an aseptic episode, uh, although this was very short after they were released. So we were sort of hoping, can we maybe uh, do biomarker profiling, especially at the glycoprotein level, and see differences between these uh, people that had a sepsis episode and the people that were healthy. Now, what we did is that we recorded these Vatuin spectra. And I think I just put them in as an animation and I just keep quiet a bit, it goes a bit fast, but you're watching here sort of barcodes and you see that every person has a different barcode. And this is very reproducible. If we isolate the plasma again of this person and do the whole follow-up again, we see that every person has a different fatuin plasma proteome proteoform profile. Now, I have to say these are not the people at the top that we got the plasma from. They, they are supposedly 20 of the most richest people in the world. I'm not sure if they would give their plasma, but it's just to depict that every person is unique. But it also means that every person's Fatuin glycoproteome profile seems to be unique. So why is it unique? Now, we wanted to explain this, and it turned out that it was interesting, but also rather difficult. First of all, we have in the human population two different genotypes that are quite abundant. Uh, so you have people that have Fatuin uh, genotype 1 and you have Fatuin genotype 2. But because you have two alleles, you have people that are homozygotes for uh, the allele 1 or homozygotes for the allele 2, and you have people that have both. And this um, uh, genotype is actually caused, or, or the consequence, of two mutations, and you see that here at the top. Actually, a methionine gets into a threonine, and a serine gets into a threonine as well. Now, it turns out that this serine threonine 256 is actually one of the major O-glycosylation sites. And it turns out that if you have a threonine, it's heavily O-glycosylated. If you have a serine, it's almost not O-glycosylated. And of course, this has a dramatic effect already on the O-glycosylation um, pattern of the different patients of the different genotypes. But does this explain everything? No, it doesn't, because we also see many other differences. So we just looked at these mass spectra as barcodes and we started to correlate them with each other. Now, by doing that, we didn't find much of a correlation. It was just way too difficult and we could not even separate the sepsis people from the healthy people. But taking into account the differences already by the genotypes, we got a little bit further and we could really separate the people by genotypes. Now you might say, do you really need mass spectrometry for that? Uh, you could also have done some sequencing, but it's actually really nice that you see that the proteoform profiles of people are really a reflection of the difference in the genotypes. Now you see here also the big box at the top is I think the one one, uh, the big box on the right bottom is the 2-2, and there were less people that we had that were actually uh, heterozygote, and they are in the middle. But we also observed some interesting things, and this is not influenced by the genotype, 
Here we have female two and female five, and actually their proteoform profiles looked very much alike. Only there was one difference. Female five had a hyperphosphorylation with two phosphorylations that was totally absent in female two. So just to show you that these differences in your proteoform profile can also be due to differences in phosphorylation. And we were pretty sure that this was not a result of sample prep, but that there was really a difference in, in, in biological background of these two people. So this was about fatuing, but should we stop with fatuing? Yeah, there are many abundant plasma proteins in, uh, in, in plasma. So we use the same method to also isolate other proteins. And I just want to show a few examples um, here, one that's also really interesting, also abundant protein, alpha-1 antitrypsin. And here we see some interesting data. This is not published yet because we don't understand it. But we see again um, peaks mass peaks of these two, uh, of, of this protein. But also this protein has different genotypes. And again, these genotypes lead to mutations. Um, and you see that on the right, um, an arginine can become a histidine, an alanine can become a valine. And again, people may be homozygote or maybe heterozygote. Now, what I find really interesting is the spectra in the middle. They are from heterozygote people. And of course, if these two alleles would produce the same protein, then it would maybe look like the third spectrum, where the green and the blue are equally abundant. So that means that allele type 1 and allele type 2 produce the same amount of protein in the plasma. But we see more and more evidence that this is not always the case. So we really see a difference, for instance, in the spectrum in the second spectrum with the ELA, ELA and the arginine his mutation where it seems that one of the genotypes leads to less abundance of the protein in uh, the plasma. And again, these small details may be very important. And of course, plasma proteomics is making big achievements nowadays, but they are totally ignored if you just only look at the abundance of the protein. So we can use mass spectrometry for genotyping of AAT, but also to measure the abundance of the different uh, allotypes in the plasma proteome. Now we went on, and uh, this is again another protein. This is alpha-1 antichymotrypsin, and this is a heavily glycosylated protein. But here we analyzed several people before sepsis and at different stages of sepsis. And what you see over here at the top and the bottom is the same uh, spectrum of the same protein, but the first protein is taken pre-sepsis and the second protein is taken after sepsis. And you see that the whole proteoform spectrum has completely changed. Um, what we annotate here is that when the people get sepsis, they get actually glycans that are longer extended, that are more bisected, but also especially they are more fucosylated, that are the, the red arrows that you see over here. Now, I don't go into the biology of this, but I, I really want to say, okay, proteoforms are there. They are alive. They respond to diseases, to physiological states. And with this high-resolution native mass spectrometry, they are measurable. So we classify all these patients. Um, I think we had about 10 at four different time points. And this is work that is in progress. Um, and we, we, we find that we really find new markers for, for following sepsis by plasma proteomics, but not by plasma proteomics, but by plasma proteoform proteomics. Now, one more example, um, but I rushed a little bit through it because of time. Um, this is another protein that most of you may find very uh, boring, haptoglobin, also extremely abundant in, in, in our plasma. But here also we have different uh, genotypes. And again, we have homozygote hep heptoglobin 1, homozygote heptoglobin 2, but we also have the heterozygote 4. Now here it has a huge effect on the oligomerization of the protein. The heptoglobin 1, if you're homozygote, you form only dimers of this protein. And this is because of the disulfide bridges and the domains in heptoglobin 1. If you have heptoglobin 2, you have an extension and you have an extra uh, sulfur group 
And this forms actually much higher order oligomers, up to trimers, tetramers, pentamers, and even further on. And of course, if you're <coughs> heterozygote, you have HP1 and HP2, or alpha and beta, and then you can form mixed dimers, and they have, again, another different shape. So we looked into this. We isolated heptoglobin um, from individual donors. And here we see a donor that has only one one. It only has the dimer. We measure this by mass spectrometry. We measure this by native mass spectrometry. And we determine the full glycosylation extent on this uh, dimer. But then we take the HP2 and we see that there are trimers tetramers, pentamers, hexamers, maybe even bigger. We also measure this by native mass spectrometry, and also here we are able to resolve the glycosylation. And we are e even able to resolve the glycosylation differences that occur on the 1-1 and the 2-2, but that also occur on the dimer versus trimer versus tetramer. And we see that the proteoform profile of the dimer is very different than of the pentamer. Again, I'm not going into the biological consequences, but I just want to show when I asked the question in the beginning, what is a protein? If I ask you what is haptoglobin in your blood, and if I have to say now, yeah, you have these um, dimers, trimers, tetramers, pentamers, all with different glycosylation forms, then it's a very difficult answer because it means that you not only have different proteoforms because of different modifications, you even have different proteoforms because of different oligomerization states. And that makes it even a bit more complex. Now here are just some of the beautiful spectra that we are able to deconvolute uh, the glycosylation patterns on these rather big haptoglobin oligomers. At the, at the bottom you see even the 240 kilodalton uh, assembly um, of, the, of the pentamer with the full glycosylation pattern. So we hope that this uh, proteoform profiling can help in the, in, in, the, um, in the way to stratify patients, to, to see how they, uh, to, be, to monitor them and to take the plasma proteomics at a higher level and to make it really plasma proteoform profiling. So now I want to move to a different topic. Um, and in the beginning I said, okay, we get high resolved spectra for intact proteins and that's why we use it for, for glyco uh, proteoform profiling, but we can also measure very, very, very large protein complexes on this UHMR. And I just want to show an example of, of what is maybe our pet molecule, but it flies really well. This is a whole intact virus, the Flockhouse virus. You see on the left where it's made of, um, it has a capsid protein, 180 copies of that. It has a, a, a gamma peptide, 180 copies of that. And as genome, it actually has two strands of RNA, uh, one of a million Dalton, uh, the other one of half a million Dalton. And this is all incorporated in this capsid. This capsid we can make fly by electrospay into the mass spectrometer, and we can get highly resolved native mass spectra of that. Um, the particle is about uh, 9.3 million Dalton in total mass. Now we can spray this by uh, ammonium acetate and it gets about 225 charges. We can also use charge reducing agents and then we shift the M over Z even to higher mass of M over Z, so to 55,000. And then it has about 170 charges. So a single particle there of the virus has 225 charges in one case, or maybe 170 charges in the other case. Now, when we started to do these measurements, we realized um, and I think I skipped this for the moment, we realized that if the instrument was really tuned down, we saw spectra like here at the bottom. And we quickly noted, and this was already uh, maybe even pioneered at PNNL uh, by Dick Smith's group, that you could, in an FTICR, but also in an Orbitrap, can detect single ion events. And so we saw these signals, and we, say, we saw really that signals were either bigger or smaller. And here's another example. And we see really that single ions give us a signal on our detector. And so we can start to do ion counting, single particle mass spectrometry. So not single cell proteomics, but single molecule proteomics or single molecule mass spectrometry. So why is this nice? Now, first I wanna show that it really works by doing a very strange experiment. We had two particles that actually when fly get into the same M over Z window, which you see over here. 
when one of them is a ribosomal particle that has a lot of RNA inside, so it gets much less charges. So Z is much lower, but M uh, over Z is the same as for the nanoparticle that we show on the left, which is a nano container. Uh, it's way bigger, uh, but it gets more charges. But here we see these single ion events and you see that the ALS particle gives a much higher signal than the 50S ribosome particle. And even if you spray them together, you can distinguish which ions come from the ALS and which particles come from the ribosome. And you see that at the bottom, we can now separate our ions, not only by M over Z, but also by intensity. And intensity is directly related now to the charge. So we have an independent charge measurement, and that's very helpful because that means that we don't have to resolve M over Z anymore because we know Z already. And this means that we can really start to resolve spectra that normally would not be resolvable anymore. Now, first we showed that this um, signal, the relationship between signal intensity and charge is really linear over the whole M over Z window that we measured. And then we said, okay, how can we use this to really do new uh, mass analysis? Now here you see a, a virus particle that we were never able to resolve, so we just got a blurb. But now by the single particle events, we can really look at the single ion events. We can filter and, and only uh, leave the ions in that are not decaying in the ion trap. And by doing that, we get really much better mass spectra data of particles that we normally could not resolve. Uh, this is just shown in this animation. You see first the full mass spectrum, but then you see the mass spectrum where we actually have a second dimension of separation. And that second dimension of uh, separation is the ion intensity or the charge. And you see that we can really separate that. Now, this really helps us to um, look at particles that normally were not so nicely resolved. We use this, for instance, to look at um, uh, different immunoglobulins. Um, and here you see an immunoglobulin M that is actually a mixture of tetramers, pentamers, and hexamers. And we were able to resolve them nicely as well. Um, we also, and this is the last application that I uh, show, we also use them now to look at um, very important particles, uh, gene delivery particles, adeno-associated viruses. And when they are produced, they sometimes are empty and sometimes they have the gene that they need to deliver packed in the genome. Now, for pharmaceutical companies, it's very important to know if their particles have the genome inside. Now, and here you see measurements of that, and we really see a cloud here and a cloud there, and we can really separate the empty particles from the genome-filled particles, and in this way, give the people a number of how many particles have the genome filled and how many didn't have it filled. Now, I think um, also because of time, I sort of uh, decide to skip the cross-linking mass spectrometry part. Um, I hope that the slides will be available and uh, they will be available to you. And if you still have questions about that part, then I will be uh, very willing to tell you about this as well. This has been published. It's about a new way to enrich uh, cross-linked uh, peptides. Um, but I'm, I, I would be very happy to present it, but I also want to stick to time. So that's why I leave this out and I finish with this slide. Thanking you for your attention and thanking the whole group uh, in Utrecht that you see here on the picture and all the people that have uh, financed the research that I was showing here. And with that, I'd like to end and uh, thank you very much for your attention and give the word back.